Hi, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. On today's program, I want to take some time to talk about the two greatest pitfalls of the last days. Now, these are issues that we rarely, if ever, hear discussed in the majority of churches today. Yet, when we look at the emphasis that's placed on these issues by Jesus and the apostles in the New Testament, then it becomes clear that if, in fact, we are approaching the last days, and I believe we are, then these are issues that we need to take the time to talk about. So the first issue, really, that is probably the most pronounced issue throughout the writings of the New Testament, the greatest warnings concerning the end times, revolves around the issue of deception. Now, in Jesus's sermon on the end times, we call that the Olivet Discourse, In Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 5, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives and he's giving the sermon to his disciples, they came up to him and they asked him concerning the signs of his return and of the end of the age. In his very first statement, the statement that he used to begin his sermon on the last days, he said this, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will mislead many. Now, if Jesus himself placed such a high priority on the issue of warning us concerning deception in the last days, then don't you think that this should be a priority within the church, that the church would be guarding itself against being deceived, that it would be guarded against deception in the last days? But the fact of the matter is, again, large segments of the church today, they're not wrestling with this issue at all. In fact, large segments of the church today are embracing a doctrine called preterism. Preterism actually teaches that the majority of Bible prophecy is already fulfilled, that largely in the events of 70 AD, with the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, that that fulfilled most of the book of Revelation and Jesus' Olivet Discourse and even a majority of the book of Daniel and Old Testament prophecy. And so if all of these things are past, then if, if someone believes this, then they're not at all concerned with or guarding against deception because they think these things are 2,000 years old. And so even preterism itself is among the great end time deceptions. This is an issue that the church needs to awaken to, begin discussing, and asking itself, what does it mean to be deceived in the last days? Now in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 9 through 10, Paul the Apostle makes it very clear that one of the primary issues in the last days would be the issue of deception. In fact, he actually describes the Antichrist as the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with the empowerment and the the false lying signs and wonders of Satan himself. And then it says, with all the deception of evil, of wickedness, specifically for those who are perishing, because, why are they perishing? Because they did not love the truth. This is the very root and the foundation of deception. The heart that does not love truth is susceptible to being deceived. Now, most people, when they read this verse, this passage, they'll say, well, that pertains to those that are perishing. In other words, that's solely for unbelievers. But the fact of the matter is, is that last day's deception is something that far supersedes merely unbelievers. It is a warning for believers as well. 
Now, it has to be said that all people, whether believers or unbelievers, we all have a propensity to be deceived. And the reason is because we all have a propensity to reject the truth. Now, if we are believers who fully embrace the full truth of the gospel, then that gospel begins with the fact that we are sinful, wretched individuals. And it is for that very reason that throughout the scriptures, the proclamation of the gospel begins with the word repent. Repent means to turn away from something that is inherent to us and turn toward the truth and the light of Christ. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, Paul the Apostle again warned that in the last days, specifically, many believers would give themselves over to self-deception. Paul says this, the time will come when believers will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers. They will gather teachers around themselves in accordance with their own desires, and they will turn their ears away from the truth. So here's the point. Deception, uh, the, the rejection of truth is not an issue that is reserved solely for unbelievers. Paul makes it clear that in the days ahead from his time, and spe- most specifically in the last days, that believers would specifically gather around themselves teachers that would say things that comfort them in their sinfulness. I mean, this is an issue when we look out at the landscape of churches, not just in the West, in the United States, but throughout the earth. Teachers that are not proclaiming the fullness of the gospel. Their messages are primarily positive. It's about self-betterment. It's about prosperity. It's about becoming more successful, about being victorious in all that you do. Jesus and the apostles were repeatedly beginning their message with the word repent. And how rare it is today that we hear messages that begin with a call for believers and unbelievers alike to repent and to turn away from their sins. My purpose is not to insult or criticize any particular individual or ministry, but I think that in light of the clear warnings of Jesus and Paul, we all need to ask ourselves, do we go to a church where the preacher preaches the hard things? Do we go to a church? Are we part of a fellowship where we are often made to feel uncomfortable because of the sinful uh, things that are in our lives? Because if we're not, if we're going to a church where the preacher is only making us feel good, if we're only going for pep rallies and personal uh, self-embetterment lectures, then we have to ask ourselves, Are we those that have accumulated for ourselves teachers that are preaching things after our own desires, that are tickling our ears and telling us what we want to hear? And if so, we are among those that are prone to self-deception. We are setting ourselves up for deception. And in fact, I, I think this is something that could be said of probably a majority of churches today across my nation and probably across a large part of the earth. And then we have really the culmination of the New Testament warnings against deception. And in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 1 through 3, this is where Paul says that in the last days there would be a great falling away. We need to read this full passage. Paul says, we request of you brothers, he's speaking to believers, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you do not be quickly shaken from your composure, nor be disturbed by a spirit or a letter as if it was from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. He says, listen, it has not come yet. He says, let no one in any way deceive you. For that day, the day of the Lord and the rapture will not come unless the apostasy or the falling away comes first. And then the man of lawlessness is revealed, who's the son of destruction. The last days, the return of Jesus will be preceded by a great falling away within the church. Believers will fall away from the Lord. 
If we hold to the position that all Bible prophecy is already fulfilled, then this is not even going to be on our radar. And yet that is an idea, that is a concept and a doctrine that is spreading throughout the church. And is it any surprise? Believers need to be aware. They need to be introspective, guarding themselves against self-deception. This is one of the primary warnings of Jesus and the apostles throughout the New Testament concerning the last days. For this week's program, we are offering the Gospel in the Last Days Bundle. This important resource bundle includes the following six resources. Joel's newest book, When a Jew Rules the World, What the Bible Really Says About Israel and the Plan of God. This powerful resource addresses all of the critical issues relating to Israel in the unfolding plan of God, exposes the errors of replacement theology, preterism, and the anti-Semitism that is now exploding across the earth. Second, you will receive the documentary film, Better Friends Than Mountains, a film about ISIS, the Kurdish people, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. This beautifully made film will inspire and move you to learn what the Lord is doing right now in one of the world's most active crisis zones. Finally, you will receive four copies of Dear Muslim Friend. This highly recommended book answers all of the primary objections to biblical faith commonly brought up by Muslims. Not only is this a critical book for all Christians, but it was specifically created to give away to Muslims. Together, these six items are valued at over $60. But when you purchase all six items at the discounted rate of only $50, you help support this ministry. Go to joelstrumpet.com and order the Gospel in the Last Days Bundle. Now I want to turn to the second greatest pitfall of the last days, and this is allowing our hearts to grow cold, allowing our love to grow cold, our love for man and our love for God. The scriptures say that this is one of the greatest issues that we also need to guard against, allowing our hearts to be weighed down with anger, with fear, with anxiety, and even prejudice and racism and rage. And listen, This is an issue that I am already seeing explode throughout the church. Now, in Matthew 24, verse 13, again, in what's called the Olivet Discourse, Jesus' greatest sermon on the end times, Jesus makes this profound warning. He says, because lawlessness will be increased in the last days, because chaos and lawlessness will explode across the earth, he says this, most people's love will grow cold. He says, but the one who endures to the end shall be saved. This is a profound warning. Jesus didn't say that the love of a few will grow cold, or he didn't even say many. He actually said the love of most will grow cold. And then he says, but enduring patiently in love while maintaining fiery hearts during the last days, those that endure They will be saved. Now, let's look at our present time. When we see groups like ISIS exploding across the Middle East, all across the earth, carrying out genocides, literally murdering hundreds and thousands of people in cold blood, kidnapping and killing children, committing mass murders, rapes, kidnappings, thousands of innocent women, wiping out Christianity largely in in large sections of the Middle East where uh, the church was established for 2,000 years, beheading our friends and family members, it is easy and it is understandable that we are wrestling with heart issues at times like this. It is understandable that people are wrestling with issues of justice and yearning for justice. But as I am looking at the trending in large segments of the church, I am seeing disturbing trends. And I understand that Islam is evil, and it's not to diminish the evil in any way, shape, or form of what is being carried out. But when I look at the response of so many Christians, my heart is broken as I am seeing people, as I said, giving themselves over to hatred, giving themselves over to fear, giving themselves over to rage and a carnal lust for vengeance and and a lust even for, for blood to be shed. 
The Lord is a just judge. We can be confident that justice will be carried out. But the scriptures say that the wrath of man does not accomplish the justice of God. When I see American leaders who are not doing what is necessary to uphold the principles enshrined in the Constitution, when I see groups like ISIS, when I see immorality spreading rampantly and being, being given a red carpet treatment in my own nation, is so easy for my heart to be weighed down with bitterness as I see even the nation that I love melting down and collapsing all around me. I look at my children and I think of their future. And it's easy for my heart to wrestle with bitterness. And, and this is, it should be for anyone that is righteous. We should be groaning at what's taking place around us. But we have to be asking ourselves, are we giving ourselves over to a carnal spirit of fear, clinging to this world? Or are we responding as Christ would respond and even loving those, whether it's corrupt politicians or the most vile of vile of radical jihadists across the earth? When you think of Muslims, do you have the love of the Father in your heart for Muslims? Or is your heart primarily given over to hatred and prejudice and fear and all of these things? How many watching this can say to yourselves, in all honesty, that you are praying for those in ISIS to repent and to come to faith? How many can say that you are giving yourselves to prayer for Muslims in the United States to, to repent and to renounce the, 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 the lies of their religion and to become followers of Jesus? How many can truly say that you have a deep love in your heart for Muslims. Yet I'm convinced that if Islam is the single greatest challenge that the church is going to face before the return of Jesus, which I am convinced it is, then the church is going to need to acquire a love for Muslims. This is going to become one of the premier issues globally for the church, which is receiving the Father's heart for those that he is going to have a great harvest across the nations. Out of the Islamic world, the Lord is going to have a great harvest. But in order for that to happen, his people are going to have his heart for Muslims. Now, I want to play for you a video that was made. It's called A Message to ISIS from the Nation of the Cross. And I believe it truly is a beautiful although very challenging, gospel response to evil in our day.
I trust that you were challenged and moved by this video as much as I was. I know that when I first saw it, I was uh, moved to tears and I posted it on my website, on Joel's Trumpet. And I'll be honest, I was expecting everyone to say, wow, this is powerful. This really moved me. I was shocked at how many of my regular readers actually reacted in a very negative way to this video. Listen, friends, beloved, we need to guard our hearts against growing cold. We need to guard our hearts against losing that burning love of the Father that sent His essence into the world to die for His enemies. There's a powerful statistic that says that 85% of Muslims that became followers of Jesus, they say the reason they became followers of Jesus was because there was a Christian that showed them love and demonstrated the love of Jesus to them. 85% of Muslim background believers that are now followers of Jesus say that they came to faith because somewhere out there a Christian showed them true and genuine love. Far, even higher than those that say, well, I read the Bible and the Bible convinced me. The greatest issue that convinced many Muslims to become Christians was that a Christian loved them. Now, we have to ask ourselves, are our words, our actions, our heart attitudes in such a way that we are going to be individuals that lead Muslims to Christ or are we those that are putting up blockades? Are that when they look at us, do they see hearts that are filled with hatred and fear? Or do they see those that are appealing in their love? We need to be asking ourselves this question again, because this is the part of the world where the greatest harvest field is at our time, and it will continue to be right up until the return of Jesus. Was it not Jesus himself who said, in Luke 6, verse 27, he said, I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. For in doing so, we are, we are imitating our Father in heaven. Luke 6, verse 35, Jesus said, love your enemies, do good, lend, expect nothing in return. When we behave not as the world behaves, Jesus says, your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to the ungrateful and evil men. The God that we are called to imitate and represent and be ambassadors of in this age is kind to those that are evil. Now, at the day of the Lord, he will execute judgment. But at this moment, he is patiently extending mercy to all men. We've received it. And we would be hypocrites if we didn't offer it out to others. That is, that's the very definition of the parable of the ungrateful servant. In the same way that the Lord extended mercy to us, we need to be proclaiming the mercy to evil men throughout the earth. Finally, Paul the Apostle reminds us that while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, Romans 5 verse 10. While we ourselves were enemies, again, it would be hypocritical for us to say, while we were enemies, we received the mercy of God. We received the mercy of God, but they don't deserve it. The Lord did not save. Listen, the Lord did not save you or me because we were better than even the most vile terrorist on the earth. The Lord saved us while... We were his enemies, and he did it out of grace and mercy. 1 Peter 2 verse 21 tells us that Jesus left us an example that we should follow in his steps. He is kind to evil men. He died for us while we were sinners, and we are called to imitate him in this present age. Now, I want to tell the story of a messianic Jewish believer uh, this was a young, shining-faced, full of the Holy Spirit, young Messianic Jewish believer. And in the streets of Jerusalem, he was murdered in cold blood. He was literally stoned to death. And as these 
self-righteous religious men literally were crushing his skull with rocks. In the streets of Jerusalem, there was a young man that was standing there, another self-righteous, radical uh, religionist, and he was holding the cloaks of those that were murdering this young Messianic Jew. And his name was Saul. And the Lord used him, the Lord saved him, and then the Lord used him to go on to write much of the New Testament. And he used him to plant churches across the Middle East and to become a father in the churches throughout the Middle East. And his name became Paul the Apostle. Now, if the Lord could do that then, then who is to say that he, will, he wouldn't or couldn't or won't do it today? We need to be people who, are, who understand the gospel of grace and mercy that led Paul the Apostle, a murderer of Christians, to become a leader in the church, that led those of us that were his enemies to become his children. And we need to extend and proclaim that same gospel even to the most evil people throughout the earth, because they will multiply across the nations in the days ahead. This is the heart that's going to be required to navigate the days ahead. Well, that's all the time that we have for now. Thank you so much for being with us. I look forward to seeing you next week. I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground.